Our second speaker for this morning is Dr. Ernest Madhu. Uh, Dr. Madhu began life in West Africa. He then trained as a cardiologist in the United States and then took what he learnt and he said to me earlier some of what he didn't learn or some of what he decided to leave behind um, to the Caribbean. And he now works internationally in innovation to provide world-class healthcare. He is the chairman and chief executive of International Healthcare Services. Delighted to introduce Dr. Ernest Madhu. Good morning. Uh, thank you for inviting me. It's always great to be back to London. Um, I'm going to try to share with you some of the things we've learned over the course of uh, career in medicine, uh, which now is pretty much focused on using innovative solutions to solve problems in developing parts of the world. Uh, some of you might be familiar with Vilfredo Pareto, um, the, whose uh, Pareto rule is coined after. Uh, this is based on an observation he made in 1906 that 80% of the land in Italy was owned by 20% of the population. <coughs> by all extent, this has been replicated in multiple other areas where 20% of the population control the majority of the resources. Uh, if we're looking at distribution of world health, uh, world wealth, uh, looking at uh, gross domestic product, for example, we'll see that the richest 20% of the world control 82.7% uh, of the income. Uh, the remaining 20% of income is shared by 80% of the world. Uh, this is not an equitable in a solution, and this is not advocating a socialist concept, uh, but it's about talking about relocation of resources so that it can be appropriated for a wider good. If we look at healthcare, we can see that Pareto's rule applies in healthcare as well. Uh, we have a situation where there is a greater burden of disease in low income countries of the world. 80% of global disease burden is seen in the poorest 20% of the countries. Uh, on the other hand, 80% of the resources available is seen in the richest 20% of the countries. Uh, that means that there is a great deficit in access uh, to care in poorer countries, and that also translates to a greater deficit in access to care for the great majority of people. Again, we have always thought that this was not an equitable you know, solution, uh, an equitable approach to uh, the way uh, we should do things. I will dare to say that I do not believe that anyone in this audience uh, believes that they have the right to decide who lives or who dies. Your life should not be more worthwhile just because of the location in which you were born. That is an accident of birth. But as human beings, as part of the global community, I think we have a responsibility to do something to correct these uh, deficits. Um, when we talk about the burden of disease, uh, the tendency has always been to look at the burden of disease in developing countries in the context of uh, communicable infectious, you know, malnutrition, and those so-called diseases of poverty uh, because we have been trained to believe that the so-called lifestyle diseases of affluence do not pose a problem in developing countries of the world. Uh, the reality is different. Uh, much of the developing world is undergoing epidemiologic transition uh, where they are still battling with uh, the uh, communicable diseases, but there has been an epidemiologic transition going on that the non-communicable diseases have taken hold. 
And if we do not learn from the mistakes made in dealing with the epidemic of uh, uh, diseases of um, uh, poverty and translate that to dealing with the rising epidemic of non-communicable diseases, then we will have learned nothing. Uh, we will be at risk of repeating the mistakes of the past. The World Health Organization has recognized uh, this problem and have defined uh, non-communicable uh, diseases in developing countries as a major public health and socio-economic problem and as a major challenge to development in the 21st century. And this is borne by the facts of 58 million people, 58 million deaths across the world. 60% of those are from non-communicable diseases. And of the non-communicable diseases, which is about 35 million every year, 28 million or 80% of that uh, are seen in developing countries of the world, contrary again to what people believe. And the most distressing fact is that 50% of that can be prevented. Uh, what do we do? Uh, with these worsening indices, we have to have a different approach to the way health systems are organized to begin to solve these problems. And this is the mission that we have been on for the past uh, several years. Uh, we identified some critical issues, one of that being technological lag, uh, that developing countries of the world have been very slow in embracing appropriate technology advances that can help to improve the quality of care and help to improve access and help to improve the quality of life as well. Uh, there is a great loss of infrastructure or lack of infrastructure and expertise in new technological advances. Uh, there is, of course, limited capacity uh, because the developing countries of the world continue to export their best brains to the developed parts of the world. So you don't really have a lot of people to run the systems uh, that are technologically advanced. And uh, worst of all, the capital access is not existent, and so many of these things are not easy to implement. This is also uh, reinforced by, you know, again, what I think has been a disservice from multilateral agencies and uh, certain major world players that have consistently encouraged the developing world to um, essentially uh, walk away from technology because they are not ready for it. Uh, it will be tantamount to telling somebody to stick to letter writing in the era of emails. Uh, because you're not there yet, or uh, don't use mobile phones because you have to start with landlines. That is completely unacceptable because the opportunity of technology is to leapfrog and then embrace what works and abandon what does not work. There is an excess abuse of technology in developed countries that a lot of things are being applied that do not have any intrinsic value, but there is a whole lot of things that have a lot of value that can be applied to development. Uh, we're seeing the advent of mobile money in developing parts of the world. In Kenya, M-Pesa uh, is a big money transfer system that has been very successful. Uh, there's some individuals in Ghana invented a system to check counterfeit drugs, uh, and that works very well. Uh, mobile phone use is all over across Africa, and uh, Africa is introducing to the world what mobile phones can be used for that have not been used in that way in the developing parts of the world, in the developed parts of the world. The reality of the matter is that technology indeed is a very cost-effective way to improve healthcare. It improves access to care, improves workflow efficiency, helps maintain and manage patient data, and keeps security of that data. And it expands access by allowing us to take care of people in remote places. I'm going to kind of share with you some of what we have done uh, using case studies from two of our projects to demonstrate how we have used technology in this way and how we have seen it transform lives in uh, the both one in the Caribbean and now the second one, Doctors on Call Service in Nigeria. Um, we, when we arrived in Jamaica in 2005, uh, we saw a dysfunctional uh, system as it relates to cardiovascular care. Uh, never mind that Jamaica is only about a few short miles from the United States. 
Uh, prior to 2005, it was widely assumed that if you need to get advanced cardiovascular care, you have to get on the plane and go to Miami. Well, that's of course if you have the money to get to Miami, if you have the visa to get to Miami, and if you're able to pay the high cost of care in Miami, because when you get to Miami, you're not paying an insurance rate, you're paying a self-pay rate, which in the United States, it's a very expensive proposition. And this is despite the fact that cardiovascular disease at the time, and still remains, was the number one cause of death and disability in Jamaica. There were a few cardiologists, there was no cardiac center of excellence, and waiting time for procedures were essentially unacceptably long. Uh, so we decided to build a center of excellence in the Caribbean. And we built the Heart Institute of the Caribbean in Kingston, Jamaica, and ultimately put satellite campuses in Mandeville and Ocho Rios in Jamaica to extend care to people. What we did was try to focus on a model of innovative solutions using smart, efficient, cost-effective, appropriate technology options uh, that are anchored on knowledge and expertise. What we also did was try to leverage that uh, to improve access, quality, and most importantly, keep the cost down, uh, where we have managed to do procedures that will cost people about 10 to 20 percent of what they would have paid if they went to the United States. Training, research, innovation remain part of it. Uh, the problem, of course, is that we recognize that for it to be effective, we have to move away from the model that talks about um, uh, that model that relies so much on foreign aid because foreign aid model is non-sustainable and despite everything you hear about foreign aid the most generous country in the world gifts out less than one percent of the GDP for foreign aid now that no nation in the world has ever developed dependent on foreign aid you have to build your own systems, and that is what we will try to do. Uh, we're happy to say that nearly 10 years, uh, the Heart Institute of the Caribbean has continued to demonstrate uh, that homegrown, indigenously built uh, institution can provide excellent care that will be a parity with what, what people are experiencing in developed parts of the world. We now have a world-class cardiac center of excellence in Kingston, Jamaica, which many years ago, or a few short years ago, people thought was impossible to come by. I'm going to run a short one-minute video uh, to give you a profile of what happens a day at the Heart Institute, and that is you know, pretty much you know, similar to what you will experience. You know, patients will come in, go through uh, their whole uh, registration process, uh, have a very comfortable uh, evaluation unit, and then have uh, access to all the procedures that otherwise were taken for granted. Now, the beauty of this is that it is not something that is restricted for the wealthy. It is something that is open to everyone. And we decided that we have to develop what we call an open access to care model that allows a tiered pricing structure so that those individuals that were always happy to fly to foreign countries to pay exorbitant fees can pay a little bit more, but still a fraction of what they would have paid. And then that gives us an opportunity to provide support to those individuals who will not otherwise have any option at all. So we do a lot of you know, uh, free service, uh, but we really don't like to call it uh, free service. We call it uncompensated care, uh, but we use the Robin Hood approach, uh, take it from those who have it uh, to take care of those who don't have it. This is possible because of the way we have leveraged technology in healthcare. We embraced telemedicine. We embraced telemedicine from very early on. Uh, back in the 90s, I worked with a very uh, great team of uh, um, uh, clinicians uh, running uh, in the telemedicine you know, program, uh, doing some project grants, and then we had a lot of experience with that. Implementation of uh, telemedicine allowed us to have a web-based approach uh, that we can have 
have image management and our own portal for electronic medical uh, reporting. Uh, that also allows us to have the opportunity of using physicians from across the globe. Uh, we have several physicians right here in the UK who participate in our program, and all they have to do, the studies are done by our CV techs, and they will log into our web portal, review the data, review the images, echocardiogram, stress testing, and provide a report electronically. So you can walk into the Heart Institute by 10 o'clock in the morning, and by 1 p.m. your report has been read in UK, and by 1.15 you have a report sent to your brother in Ethiopia. And that is the way you know, we have uh, done this. It's very cost effective. So we have systems set up. Uh, there's a switch hub approach where, where these multiple satellite systems uh, that we have put in what we call practice partner locations across the island, uh, across the Caribbean, and the studies can be done by cardiovascular techs, and then they can be read in remote locations by experienced physicians that we will not ordinarily be able to afford to bring to the Caribbean to practice. Uh, we have our own telemedicine portal uh, that allows you know, these studies to be distributed across the globe, and then you can watch it from anywhere you are. If you have the expertise, provide an opinion, and then that gets back you know, to uh, the local pra uh, practicing, local uh, physicians who take care of these patients. Uh, access to patient records is a click of the mouse, and then we use what we call smart electronic medical record. Uh, this allows us to uh, send our reporting you know, by email to physicians of record, and we have a patient portal that allows the patients access to their records to review their files and uh, uh, notify us if they have found any errors. So this is what we have managed to accomplish in the Caribbean, and uh, it's uh, been a source of uh, um, inspiration and benefit to a whole lot of people uh, in the region. The outcome is that after these years, uh, almost all cardiovascular procedures in Jamaica can be obtained on demand, as opposed to waiting six months uh, prior to our arrival in Jamaica. I'm going to quickly move on to a project we're running in Nigeria now, uh, which is our Doctors on Call service. Uh, when we arrived in Nigeria a few years ago, looking again, again, it's about looking at the problems, uh, seeing what the solutions could be, uh, taking the solutions from what has worked elsewhere. There are a lot of things that have worked well in the United Kingdom, but there's a whole lot of things that can be done better. There are a lot of things that have worked well in the U.S., but there's a lot that can be done better. So what we do is we take those things that we believe have worked well in the U.K., we take those that have worked well in the U.S., and hope that we do not take those that have not worked so well, and then try to you know, use that as a, an opportunity to make our things better in the developing countries. One of the things I think you guys do well here is that NHS has the NOS line where people can dial in and then speak to a medical pro provider and ask questions and then get information. After all, good health care is based on information dissemination. And when we arrived in West Africa, we found the main problem is that information flow is almost non-existent. They, there is no pattern of doctors being on call. There is no pattern of patients accessing healthcare providers after hours. Insecurity is a major problem, so people do not even want to get out of their house. They will rather deal with the issue until the next morning. The problem is that sometimes what you're dealing with till the next morning could kill you before the next morning, and your life could be saved if you can pick up the phone and speak to somebody and get meaningful medical advice. So we decided to launch Doctors on Call service with several uh, subsidiaries to provide uh, you know, several things. Uh, the beginning point is that we believe that access to medical advice and healthcare information should be routinely and readily available. So what this means is that we have built a national medical call center which is the first national medical call center in Nigeria. Nigeria is, by the way, 160 million people, official count. Uh, unofficial count is that it's probably somewhere around 220 million. Uh, there is no 911 service. There is no emergency medical response service. 
There is no national hotline where people can call for information. We've tried to address this by building a national medical call center that is by subscription basis that makes it very affordable for everyone to sign up and be able to speak to a doctor 24 hours, seven days a week and by just picking up a phone. And this is again because we're taking advantage of the ubiquitous nature of mobile telephone technology in West Africa, in Nigeria, we have 60 to 90 million unique subscribers of telephones in Nigeria. By contrast, landlines in Nigeria is probably less than 700,000, and many of them are non-functional. So, but everyone has access to a mobile phone. That allows you to pick up the phone, call and speak to a doctor. We're staffing our call center with doctors. And we use a platform that is tested. We built it ourselves. And it has internationally accepted uh, protocols that allows the physicians to you know, scroll down and uh, provide better advice you know, to the patients. Uh, what it does for the subscribers is... is has greatly improved their access to healthcare. It's, um, you know, makes it possible now to have a more appropriate and planned physician visit, uh, has reduced transportation costs and time wasted away from work and foregone earnings. Earlier intervention, better outcomes. And this is, um, you know, something that has been shown in other parts of the world. If you take examples from you know, Canada, for example, in Ontario, uh, you'll see that the breakdown of this shows that about 35% uh, of the uh, calls will result in self-care and about 43% will result in a directed physician visit. Uh, but at least when you're going to the doctors, you will know what you're going to the doctor to say and the records will be made available to the doctor. Our protocol has what we call a call line interface. When individuals sign up, they sign up with up to three telephone numbers. When they call the service with any of those three numbers, the system automatically recognizes who they are. And there is an electronic medical record bill for each call. That record is automatically transferred to their doctor. Uh, can be sent by SMS text, the short form, and it can also be sent by email, the long form. The question that we were asked when we started this is what about those patients who will need to see a doctor and still the deficit is that these clinics are not always available and accessible. So we decided that we will augment our services with traditional clinics that we call the DOCS concierge clinics. Uh, these are the first concierge clinics in West Africa and they uh, provide access to telemedicine. Uh, we're working with a company in the United States to facilitate telemedicine consultations with experts in the U.S. Uh, we have also provided electronic uh, uh, consultation and second opinion, uh, which I will go over a little bit later. Uh, this, again, is addressing the deficit in access. This is our clinic. In um, one of our clinics, we have built two clinics in Nigeria now, one in Lagos and one in the southeastern part of the country. And we decided the country is broken in six geopolitical zones. Uh, we've decided we will put one docs concierge clinic in each of the six geopolitical zones. That will make it accessible and easier for people. And so we build it in, to be uh, similar to what, uh, well, not similar, we want to make it a very comfortable environment. Uh, so again, we depend on the wealthy people who are constantly flying to UK and flying to Dubai and flying to everywhere. You create an environment and the services that are comparable and sometimes better than some of the services they're getting overseas. And you bring them in. This is a very well landscaped uh, long driveway. We have both, and that's our waiting room, and there's the echo lab, the stress lab, and you know, the concert. So with this, we can retain those who have the resources, and with the money that they bring into the clinic, we're able to take care of those who do not have the means. But there are still challenges that exist. 
The challenges are that there is the local uh, primary care doctors have limited access to specialist opinions and uh, clinics and the hospital uh, are overwhelmed by so many patients that have complex medical issues that they cannot you know, deal with. Uh, to do that, that is where I go back to the telemedicine project. We partner with uh, NetMed. Uh, we're working with NetMed and uh, we're introducing audiovisual telemedicine consultation that people can walk into any of our facilities and then can actually consult with an expert. If you're looking for a pediatric neurologist, it is possible that the entire country does not have a single pediatric neurologist, but we have access to a treasure trove of pediatric neurologists somewhere else overseas, you don't have the means to go. We will set up a telemedicine consultation using a VoIP-based solution uh, that virtual diagnosis and treatment can be provided without you uh, leaving the comfort of your country. Uh, we're also working with uh, Best Doctors, uh, that's an offshoot of Harvard Medical School, uh, launching the electronic consultation and second opinion uh, to help to provide access to, this is almost sort of like a support service we're going to be providing to the area hospitals. So that when they have complex medical issues, they can bring the records and we will summarize the case, scan it in the system, and then put it in collaboration with best doctors, get it in the hands of uh, best-in-class uh, physicians. Uh, the way the process flows is that the docs, uh, clinicians, will collect all the information and then transport it over the docs' best doctor's portal, and an expert or a group of experts will review and write an opinion. Uh, we can also upload uh, the imaging files into the system to help in the assessment that will need to be uh, provided. So this has you know, worked very well, and um, it is continued to be work in progress. Uh, you can send picture file that you know, can help uh, making an assessment, and uh, the expert physician will write an opinion and then send back. There's an area that I just want to touch you know, briefly, which we call our DOCS Remote Patient Monitoring Service. Again, uh, taking advantage of advances in technology. Uh, working with a company in San Francisco, uh, leveraging what has been there. Again, sometimes always it's very amazing to me how some of these things exist uh, but other structural impediments you know, make it difficult to deploy to the benefit of the you know, patients. With um, the uh, group we're working uh, with uh, in uh, San Francisco, we're designing a dashboard. Uh, we're focusing right now on hypertension and diabetes, which are major problems in West Africa. It is estimated that by the Nigerian Medical Association that about 56 million Nigerians have hypertension, and most of them are not properly monitored or treated. So what we have done is uh, working with this group to create a hypertension dashboard. And that hypertension dashboard is monitored, will be monitored by a group of hypertension specialists. And the way it works is uh, we have a blood pressure measuring device that is Bluetooth enabled, and then with an Android device or any iPhone or any Android or any smartphone, uh, you will measure your blood pressure and that blood pressure record will automatically transfer to your smartphone and it's stored and forward. And once it gets to your smartphone, it is immediately transferred to the cloud server. And that cloud server is where the dashboard resides. And this expert will monitor and send recommendations to the local uh, physicians. Again, we'll do this for diabetes. You know, we have the capability of doing it for weight management, for diabetes, for hypertension. But for right now, we're focusing on hypertension and diabetes. Uh, the last piece of the puzzle, of course, is to resolve the emergency response situation. And that is what we have, um, you know, uh, we're starting what we call DNA, uh, doctors and nurses anywhere, uh, that will run an emergency medical service that will allow 
um, deployment of emergency response with trained paramedics to individuals at the time of their emergency need. These are people who will not benefit from waiting or who will not benefit from uh, just a telephone conversation. Uh, we have also gone into, again, it's a lot of strategic partnerships that go into doing what we do, working with a company in Tennessee, in Chattanooga, uh, to create uh, what we call, this is a DOCS uh, emergency medical phone uh, that has an SOS button at the back of it. And once people sign up to this service, they will receive this phone. And this phone is programmed to ring to the emergency contact center. And all you have to do in terms of emergency is to press the uh, SOS button at the back and it will uh, send a signal, text message to multiple numbers and then ring at a contact center and an ambulance will be dispatched. So this has been uh, something of, uh, it's been very exciting you know, for us and uh, we have seen uh, the transformation of the healthcare landscape by making simple changes and bringing some innovative solutions that have been in existence elsewhere but may be not used in the same way but tweak it to the local environment to create value for the patients, create value uh, for our investors as well uh, because at the end of the day uh, we run this as a sound on a sound business principle uh, again like I've said before uh, just try to raise hundred pounds or hundred dollars for a sustainable project in a developing world, uh, it's not going to happen. But try to raise one million pounds for charity that is not monitored, it's going to happen fairly quickly. Now, there is a difference to be made between charity and humanitarian aid. Now, in times of humanitarian crisis, uh, we all need to step up and provide charitable assistance. But to use charity as a, uh, as a bedrock for development, it is not sustainable. It's not going to work. Uh, the most sorry sight I saw in Arusha, Tanzania, was the so-called aid workers, uh, the young men and women, mainly from the UK and the United States, prancing around in SUV vehicles, living in the best neighborhoods, and they're providing charitable care to poor people, uh, rural farmers. Uh, sometimes when you do the numbers, you say if you take away all this fluff and then distribute the resources to these rural farmers, maybe they wouldn't need the aid workers anymore. So I think we need to be looking at embracing innovative solutions that create sustainable development impact train the local people, build internal capacity, solve existing problems, and do not build programs that are perpetually dependent on charity and dependent on the whims and caprices of someone across the ocean. And this is the message that we send out. Um, one of the most gratifying things we've have gotten in the, you know, uh, not so long uh, is a group of, uh, just to share with you a very short story, I received an email from uh, uh, these young people, Sarah, and Clement, Sarah Clement and Dagmar English, uh, both students at Aalborg University in Denmark. And um, it's gratifying to say that inspiration that they derived from our work made them start looking for sustainable solution, and they picked diabetes as one area they're going to look at. And this is the end result. They've created what I think is going to be a life changer. It is, they call it D2. This is a glucose measuring device that uses electromechanical measuring method and does not use disposable strips. Now, the problem for most poverty-stricken locations is that even when you get this, the recurrent expenditure from disposable strips make it unsustainable. So what they have done is taken this out of the equation, and then this is going to be uh, very, very applicable to the environment where we work. So I'm very proud to introduce you know, their work, uh, more so that it was inspired from the work that we have done. At the end of the day, 
sustainable solutions are the only things that matter. You have to anticipate, adapt, and respond. Uh, we have to develop cost-effective, uh, multidimensional technology transfer policy and action plan. We have to build and maintain the relevant infrastructure to sustain what we have developed. Uh, internal capacity is critical. Uh, one of the things we do when we get into a location is to start identifying local talent you know, for training. Uh, it is not the same. You can fly in people from overseas to provide service, but it will be for a short period. Oftentimes, pressures from family and other social obligations will make them not stay. But you take people who have roots in the area, train them, give them the skills, they will stay for a long time and they will train others. Capital remains a problem. Uh, if anyone has a solution, I would love to hear. Um, access to capital is one of the greatest impediments. I'm sure there are a lot of people who think like we do about these type of innovative solutions but do not have access to capital uh, to make it happen. When that changes, it will uh, make a lot of difference. Uh, lastly, I think these uh, developing countries must also uh, learn to uh, jettison some advice that is not beneficial to them. Uh, any advice to not embrace technology, I think, is a wrong-headed advice. Technology is not going away. Uh, the most important thing is to identify appropriate technology, appropriate and cost-effective technology, and sustainable technology. Uh, when we apply that to healthcare, I believe we can make a lot of difference, improve the quality of life, improve care, reduce disease burden, and at the end of the day, the society wins, the global community wins. Thank you. I can't do better than quote, um, we've had lots of tweets, but here's one from SK Ayers at Meduec. Fabulous talk on using innovative technologies to break down barriers of healthcare access in developing countries. But I think we all really felt completely um, gobsmacked by what you've achieved. Thank you so very much indeed. Thank you. Both of our speakers are at the front if you want to come and talk to them. I'm sure they'd love to see you. And please have a great break and come back here if you want to for the um, London Paralympic and Olympic team at 11 o'clock. See you later. <laughs>